Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hot Takes with me, the Silver Fox. Now, if you ask any doctor or nurse about social distancing in a hospital, they will tell you it's very, very vitally, indeed, vitally important that patients are kept well away from each other. If you have a lot of people in close quarters in a confined space, well, diseases, infections run rampant and anyone can catch anything from anyone else. And that is why they keep them apart. And that's why they put things and barriers in between, just to make sure that there's a reduction in the risk of cross-contamination. And of course, during COVID, we had three years of Nippy standing at the front of the room telling us how important social distancing was. So there's no excuse. Everybody knows it. The people running hospitals certainly know it. So it makes it odd then that they will be putting two and sometimes three people in a single occupancy room with no curtain dividers, with no privacy, with nothing to stop infection cross-contamination. They're putting beds into cupboard spaces. They're putting more beds into larger wards than they're designed to handle and effectively increasing the, the patient density within a hospital. Apparently, health and safety has been thrown out of the window and cross-contamination is now a thing of the past and it doesn't really matter if you pick up infections from other people in your weakened state. That's how the hospitals in Scotland are now being run. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But then it is the SNP that is responsible for the health service. And so they've probably run out of money. Let's have a look at this, this article to see what's going on and see why. All of a sudden, all those COVID rules no longer apply. Here it goes. So safety fears at Scottish hospitals at, as patients are forced to share single rooms and some are being treated in socialisation spaces amid NHS overcrowding crisis. Now, socialisation spaces are the old, you know, the old social rooms. So it used to, we used to have smoking rooms, if you can remember them. Uh, and it's where patients who were available to get up and basically go and sit down, watch a bit of telly or whatever, and mingle with each other. And now they're treating patients in those because they're running out of space. Now, I would suggest any patient or any family member of a patient goes to the hospitals and when they see this sort of thing happening, ask to speak to the union rep available and ask the union rep available, has um, impact assessment being done, has a health and safety uh, assessment being done, um, you know, what are, the reward, what are the results of that, what's the risk management, can you see the results and these of course they cannot be refused, these are instantaneously um, requested and must be provided at that point they cannot ever withhold safety uh, briefings they cannot withhold risk assessments it's a legal requirement for them to publish them and so all you have to do is ask for the risk assessment and if they haven't got one then you immediately get on to the HSE and tell them that they are performing dangerous um, life risking life threatening uh, manoeuvres within that hospital by putting beds that close together and things um, and that they're failing to do risk assessments which is a legal obligation so uh, I bet there's no uh, risk assessment on this because if uh, they did a risk assessment it would never have passed muster anyway hospital bosses are trying to cram multiple beds into available spaces in some shared single rooms there were no screens to protect patient privacy or indeed cross-contamination as I say Patients at a Scottish hospital have been forced to share these single rooms, prompting a health watchdog to issue a warning over safety and privacy. That's how bad it is. Uh, with, the, with the NHS battling overcrowding crisis, hospital bosses are trying to cram as many beds into, into uh, available spaces as possible. There is an alternative, you know. You could build another hospital, or is that just too much effort? Much easier, I think, really, to spend billions on foreign embassies rather than sort of build a hospital. But who knows? Uh, an inspection by Healthcare Improvement Scotland found examples of where two patients were sharing, sharing single occupancy rooms, creating challenges in maintaining dignity and respect. Uh, in some shared single rooms, there were no screens available to protect patient privacy. It also emerged that some patients were being treated in an interview room and in socialisation spaces such as patient lounges because they haven't got the room, because they daren't tell people they won't build any more hospitals now this guy no he's a tory mp 
um, Ghislaine, that's Sandesh Ghislaine. He's always up in the, uh, in, in, uh, as I said MP, it's MSP, but he's always up in Holyrood, always complaining about what the, uh, the SNP are doing to the NHS. And of course, he works at the pointy end of this. He's a doctor. Uh, he, um, he's, he's forever pointing out all the problems that are caused, and as he points out, directly by the SNP's policies. This isn't as though this is a problem general within the hospital. It is particularly their policies. Anyway, Scotland's health service faces huge demand for treatment and continuing problems with delayed discharge causing bed shortages. Now, delayed discharge is all the elderly people with difficulty in finding social care as they come out. Now, uh, Freeman, of course, managed to get rid of the, um, the, the, the basically bed blocking, uh, what they used to call bed blocking, the delayed discharge. Um, Freeman uh, managed to do that a couple of years ago. She got rid of thousands. Brilliant idea. Uh, and she did it by euthanizing the uh, the patient allegedly. Uh, she certainly issued her as as the health minister. She certainly issued the guidelines that um, this is how you you help to get rid and treat COVID. And the word treat is very much in you know in quotation marks because one of the treatments that was advised and said was a fine treatment uh, was what they used to euthanize end of life patients, uh, and that's what Freeman put out. Uh, we've covered that. That's in the, in the Merlin files. And if you go back and watch uh, the Merlin interviews there um, and the various things that we've done, uh, one of the early ones was all about this treatment being put into um, the official guideline, the official guidebook of how to treat COVID. Now, of course, they took that straight off um, the government website. But if you use the Wayback Machine, which we did, and we got a copy of it, uh, and that was up there. So uh, we published that as well. Uh, and you can see that the official treatment was, of course, to euthanise the patient. And that's how you cure bed blocking, according to Gene Freeman, allegedly. Anyway, the Scottish Conservative health spokesman, Dr Sandesh Ghislaine, here above, said Scotland's health boards are suffering under intolerable, intolerable strain due to the SNP's dire workforce planning. It is vital patient privacy and confidentiality, uh, confidentiality is not compromised. This raises concerns about infection control and the difficulties for staff looking after more patients, which we've covered. There is no privacy, there is no dignity, and infection control just doesn't exist. There is no control. It is a free-for-all. For the diseases and illnesses and viruses up there, it is like the Wild West. They can hitch a ride into anywhere and they are free to travel. Nobody is doing any form of infection control. Uh, the emergency measures were highlighted in a separate report from uh, HIS and the NHS Dumfries and Galloway. HIS carried out a three-day snap inspection of Dumfries and Galloway, Galloway uh, Royal Infirmary in March. Its report said the hospital, like much of the NHS Scotland, was experiencing a significant range of pressures, including increased admissions, increased waiting times, inadmission units and reduced staff availability. During our inspection, the site was operating at over 100% capacity. And that means people weren't getting treated effectively or quickly or in some times at all. Um, people would undoubtedly be dying as a result of the poor service of this hospital. And I'm sure I can, you know, I, I, I will put it this way. I am 100% I am sure that the staff there are working absolutely flat out. They're doing their best. They are working as hard as they can. They're dedicated. They're not sitting on their backsides letting this slide. The staff are working hard. Unfortunately, the staff are under-resourced. There's not enough staff. There's not enough space. There's too many managers making too many decisions. What you need is a second hospital and more staff and split the load. If you haven't got a second hospital, extend the first hospital by a thousand beds. And then hire not doctors and nurses to treat those thousand beds. It's the only way you can do it. And you go, oh, but we can't afford it. It's funny how you can't afford that. But you can afford eight and a half million pound a month for spin doctors for the NHS in Scotland. You can afford 10 million a year for your embassies abroad. You can afford money left, right and centre. You can spend 136000 sending a bunch of wankers on a three-day jaunt to New York at public expense. That's three nurses. 
You can afford that, but you can't afford three nurses. I think the priorities of the SNP are not necessarily aligned with the priorities of the people of Scotland. And when all these SNP people are sitting there foaming at the mouth and going, yes, but the SNP is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Just wait until Granny dies because she's waiting in a corridor. The SNP brilliant then when your Granny's dying in a corridor. Or is it more important that Angus Robertson goes off on a piss up at public expense? You have to make a priority judgment, don't you? It's all about calls. Look at the facts. Look at the facts. Where's the money better spent? Angus Robertson slipping dollar notes into the waistline of a stripper in a club in New York. Or your granny getting that new hip. Anyway, while praising staff and good levels of care in the, ma uh, uh, in the majority of areas, he said, the report concerned, uh, raised concerns over privacy, consent and fire regulations arising from contingency beds. This is the other thing, of course. That's one of the risk assessments. By having more people in more beds and, and tighter space in the event of a fire, how do you get these people out quickly? Where's the risk asse assessment? Go to that hospital. If you any patient in there, or anyone with a who's relative of a patient in there, go to the hospital. Ask to see the risk assessments. If they haven't done it, they're breaking the law, and the chief executive is responsible, and he needs to answer to the police. He has broken the law. Uh, he said there are additional beds placed in single rooms to increase occupancy or the use of non-standard care areas for inpatients. Now, if you're in a non-standard care area, you cannot guarantee it's cleaned to a sufficient clinical level. You cannot guarantee it will be serviced and manned to the correct level. And if you are getting extra people in and are not employing extra nurses to care for them, then you are having a reduction in care availability for each payment, patient on average. So instead of having one nurse for four patients, you might have one nurse for 10 patients. How can one nurse possibly care for 10 patients? You know, because you're going to have bloods drawn, you're going to have notes taken, temperatures taken, there'll be supply and removal of, um, you know, bottles for urine, there'll be uh, commode time, you know, you have all these things. Bed changes, washing, you know, patient care is a hard thing. I, I know, having been at the back end of it and sat and watched 10 urine bottles of piss sit on the table because it couldn't be collected because there was no one there they weren't they weren't weren't hanging around i mean they were busy they were busy with so many people there was 10 bottles of urine sitting on my table where they were serving my food nhs hospital kettering terrible hospital worst hospital i've ever been in um anyway not staff please get me wrong i'm not blaming the staff anyone who watches this and works at kettering Please understand, I know it's not you. It's systemic. It's management. It's the whole system. It's not the staff. They work incredibly hard. Nothing but respect for the ones, for the for the ground troops. For the ground troops work hard. It's, it's, it's the seniors it's causing the problem. Anyway, uh, he said, however, we observed double occupancy created challenges in maintaining dignity and respect for patients as not all rooms had privacy screens. In one ward, we observed a patient being moved temporarily into the corridor to allow the other patient privacy. How can that possibly be right? NHS Governor Freese in Galloway must ensure that when patients are cared for in an additional beds, risk assessments and patient selection criteria are consistently applied. There is no risk assessment. If there was a risk assessment done, it would not allow this. Health and safety would not allow this. Uh, the report also reveals the A&E interview room was used as a patient treatment room during times of increased pressures. And the issue of contingency beds was also raised in a performance report before the NHS Dumfries and Galloway board, which said we currently operate continuous flow by going one up on the wards, using socialisation space and have also the potential to double up our single rooms according to set trigger points. You could have someone with incredibly infectious disease who must be kept away. And yet they're going to put someone in there who might be vulnerable due to, you know, um, what do you call it, autoimmune deficiency or something. Next thing, he's carking it, he's dead. Because, not deliberately like the guy that's infectious, but, you know, he's infectious. People aren't doing these risk assessments. Uh, so, uh, socialisation spaces were previously described by the board as open plan areas to promote interaction between patients and prevent isolation. The health board said, we welcome the findings of the inspection, which are generally positive. None of that sounds positive to me. How can that possibly be positive? Our surge planning identifies a small number of rooms that can accommodate two patients. Privacy has been an occasional issue and one we've worked to address. What you need to do to work to address it 
is to have a maximum number and otherwise open up a second hospital. Doesn't matter the cost. People will bear it. The public will bear the cost of a second hospital. They won't bear the cost of piss-ups in New York, of £8.5 million a month being spent on spin doctors and £10 million a year spent on embassies that you've no need for, plus all the other waste left, right and centre. Anyway, I shall finish there and come up. Now, Sandesh Ghislaine is completely correct, of course. He is one of the few experts in the field, literally, uh, within the Scottish Parliament. He stands there. He's His brief uh, for the Tories, he, he's, the, he's the health secretary, sorry, the shadow health, the Tory shadow health secretary. He speaks for them on health and social care and, you know, and hospitals and things like that, the NHS. Because he is the expert. He is a doctor that works within it. And so not only is he an expert by having the briefs on it and knowing what he's talking about and meeting the people politically sided, he's also there treating the patients, talking to them, seeing the nurses, seeing what is going wrong, seeing what is falling apart, seeing what is needed and what is not being provided. And the big thing that's not being provided, of course, is resources. They need more nurses. They need more medical staff of all levels, in fact. They need more spaces. They need to expand the hospital. Throw in another couple of wards. It isn't a problem. You know, you just go to an existing hospital, you get someone in. And if it's £10 million to build a low... It doesn't have to be the high-intensity wards or anything. It can just be a low-intensity service ward. You know, and you can put people in there and go and call it the, you know, the, the exit ward or something. You know, it's the ward you put people in uh, when they're coming close to the end of treatment and then they go. You're not having high intensity. You don't need relapse. You don't need this and that and the other. Just a low intensity ward. But if you can free up, say, 100 beds, 100 beds makes a massive difference in a hospital. It might be 10% or 15% of that hospital's capability just for the low end stuff there. Throw in some, you know, throw in a night doctor, a day doctor, you know, a doctor to cover each shift, a few nurses per floor, because these are low intensity patients. They don't need the same level of care as people in the main core of the hospital. It's a lot lower price, but you're shifting these people out of the high intensity into the low intensity. It frees up the whole system. It's not rocket science and it wouldn't cost that much to build, relatively speaking, or to run, again, relatively speaking. Quite easy. And yet they won't do it because it's more important that they have spin doctors. The NHS is falling apart, but while they're spending all this money telling you it's not, some people will believe them. And those people are the very stupid ones who keep voting for the NHS, despite what they can obviously see. I'll vote for the NHS, voting for the SNP, despite what they can obviously see with their own eyes. It is sad. Anyway, I shall stop there. Thank you very much for uh, watching. If you like what you're seeing here on the channel, please hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, leave a like, leave a comment, please share the video. And until next time, stay safe, stay well, and for heaven's sake, stay out of hospital, please. Bye.